Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to touch uh, right now on a theme that will continue through the through the boot camp. Um, it has to do with this vision of systems data science and some of the fundamental principles that make it up. Um, Rather than giving an exhaustive introduction to this now, I'm going to uh, refer to a few of its most salient aspects, resting confident that uh, over the course of the past day, we have captured both a, a perspective on system science and its use on the one hand, and uh, highlighted some of the major features of data science and uh, its use of, of machine learning and big data in particular on the other. Having introduced elements of that, talked about particular big data sources um, uh, and discussed perspectives from, from each side, I'd like now to kind of take stock a little bit about some aspects of, of what we've learned. And I've, I've argued that data science and system science are both rich computational traditions, uh, that they are fundamentally uh, have different traditional focus uh, and uh, different questions that they bring to bear, um, but that they are compatible and in fact overlapped in a lot of their, um, their perspective on the one hand and are synergistic on the other. Uh, the compatibility reflects, for example, the fact that in data science, because of the emphasis on the four Vs, in particular the high velocity and high variety elements, we often have longitudinal resolution, fine-grained temporal and locational Sort of say a particular participant over time in a rich way that relates to particular causal pathways and that that reflects the fact that when we build models in the system science area we do so articulating multiple causal pathways multiple ways a person can get infected with HIV for example sexual transmission uh, transmission through uh, intravenous drug use um, transmission perhaps through um, uh, bloodborne infections associated with transfusion or what have you. Um, often in our dynamic models we exhibit particular pathways that are the generative pathways at issue and we, we wish to reason about them and system science provides us a, um, a means of doing so. Uh, Data science provides us means of doing so through, through uh, uh, big data's capacity to resolve different pathways. It's, it's specificity. For example, tracking aspects of social contacts on the one hand versus time spent outside versus time spent with a dog um, uh, in close proximity inside. Resolving sedentary behavior and, and vigorous physical activity. Um, recognizing cases of social interaction, um, the regularities of someone's schedule. We can resolve things with big data at the level of causal pathways in a way that often maps directly to our models or maps quite conveniently onto our models. We're capturing things behavior over time which is central to the goals and to the enterprise of dynamic modeling. Uh, we are doing so at a fine locational level, often individual level, longitudinally. Um, and we can act, capture aspects of individual level context that play a big role in data science. Within critical realism, we speak about the importance of context, mechanism, and outcome. And the critical realist perspective is one that has remarkable parallels with the system science perspective. And I know of no better source than data science and specifically big data for allowing us to understand context. 
whether it's aspects associated with geography captured by tweets or, or captured in search data, or whether it's the richer information captured by smartphones and wearables as to where we are, with whom we are, etc. We can capture aspects of context in a very rich way with our data that can inform our models. And finally, uh, some of the finest uses for uh, big data and for data science have to do with being able to understand the effects of interventions. Um, I believe these are areas where uh, data science has been underplayed comparatively but has huge potential. And when we undertake interventions and we pick up aspects of their functioning, what's going on with, say, smartphones and wearables, we can understand what we successfully changed, what we didn't change. Remember back to that example yesterday of moving families from a low-income neighborhood to a mixed-income neighborhood. We can better understand to what degree the families were making use of the improved food environment versus we're making use of ball courts versus we're making use of the sidewalks or out at night or making use of open space. We could see how much time they're spending at home versus at convenience stores or restaurants. We can better explain why we see the overall outcomes we do in terms of, say, reduced obesity among teenage girls. That has to do with causal pathways, but when we undertake it with respect to an intervention, it's particularly important because with respect to an intervention, we know where we need to do better next time. And we can use system science models to ask, to design more effective interventions that leverage that knowledge. So there's a fundamental compatibility here between the two techniques. But at the same time, there's profound synergies here. And I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but um, you know, many of the synergies uh, that I see lie in the the enabling for counterfactual reasoning uh, in data science, enabled by, by system science, understanding system-wide implications of our data science evidence as it relates to what's going on elsewhere in the system, as it relates to the dynamics of that, that broader system, um, and, uh, and an understanding the, the capacity to learn from, from counterfactuals and uh, uh, drivers for why we see certain outcomes empirically that are a reflection of emergence. They are a reflection of, of uh, many factors interacting. And with system science, we can tease out why might we see certain patterns in our data. Um, system science can allow us to envision more effective counterfactual, say, interventions on the basis of model and data. And we can use system science to test out our inferencing, as we referred to yesterday, and to set uh, sampling requirements on the data science side. System science um, is benefited hugely by data science. The capacity to more quickly falsify our models, challenge our models, in short, advance our models, get that success in learning that's so central to modeling rather than viewing models as having failed if they failed to, to capture um, aspects of real world behavior. We learn that our thinking just doesn't add up um, to, uh, to account for that behavior and we can advance our thinking and those models. Um, we can pin the models down in terms of their assumptions uh, by this pathway specific evidence that we gather through data science. We can reground our model on a high velocity basis, as you'll see this afternoon, and, and high velocity observations. We can have databases, which are very useful for model parameterization or to match model outputs on um, for calibration. And uh, we can stimulate dynamic hypotheses that might be incorporated in system science models by more exploratory data analysis. Um, we can more quickly, when we're in an intervention regime, learn from that intervention regime using techniques like particle filtering, particle MCMC, as new data comes in with different associations than were in place previously, we can learn to inform a model in this new uh, regime um, and uh, make sure that its expectations accord with what we observed uh, historically. And finally, although I'm not talking about it until Friday, the technique we've just seen with a delay embedding 
can be used to assess causal links, to assess when one variable is driving another, vice versa, both or neither. We can assess the direction and to, to a certain degree the strength associated with um, causal linkages or identify uh, the plausible absence. Now there's a couple key elements that I want to drive home here about system data science. Um, one of them is the recognition of the need, the conviction that um, from a system data science perspective, there's a real need to reason about the underlying system, um, and particularly for interventions to have durable impact. As my colleague Jeff McDonald says, to put in place fixes that stay fixed, to eliminate risk of blowback, to prevent us squeezing the balloon here and just having it pop out unexpectedly over there. We need to reason something about the underlying system that's out there. Recognizing that many places of it are not observable. And what we do see from certain places, we want to maximize the gain about insight into the broader system. So we want to recognize that different data sources drawn from different places in the system are often tell us, whisper to us, as we saw in this last example about that broader system. From just the information about hairs, I can reconstruct that dynamics for the broader system. From just the information about lynxes, I could reconstruct the broader system. If we observe just cases of overdoses um, uh, from, a, from the opioid context, or cases of individuals whose prescriptions were stopped because they were deemed disordered, it tells us something about what's going on in other areas of the system. If we look at treatment volumes, it tells us something about what's going on in terms of addiction. So we want to maximize this in a complex world, in a world with many latent factors. We want to maximize what we can make out from data sources we do have. And we do so by recognizing that they're part of this unified coupled system. They're part of a data generating process that gives rise to the data that we need to reason about for interventions to have durable impact. Um, and we need to recognize um, that we can understand large parts of the system without having data about every piece. We can recognize large parts and just data about specific pieces. Um, there's a need to commit to models as learning tools that we need to stay humble with. Um, they need to learn from evidence as it comes in. And the richer the evidence, the more quickly the higher velocity can arrive, the uh, greater variety it offers, and the greater veracity, the more we can make use of it to pin our models down. I sometimes think of models as a weird analogy. Um, I'll, I'll just throw it out there and see if it sticks. Um, I often think of our models as, as sort of tarps. Um, I don't know where I, where I got this. Maybe it's the manifolds and state space. But our models are kind of like tarps. And I don't know if you've ever worked with tarps on a windy day, but they, they, can, they can have problems with flapping. Um, I once was, was working with a tarp on a, on a structure that was being used uh, for a for a, a, a holiday, and uh, it, was, it involved these big uh, metal poles and tarps on the top, and wind got hold of it, and what about, I don't know, 10 meters up or something like that, and I had to run away from it, because otherwise I, I, I would have become uh, potentially impaled. Um, but uh, tarps, tarps if, if you just have them unconnected with things, they can kind of flap around it. So you want to pin it down as many places as possible. And our model outputs data. It's kind of a response surface. Um, and there's many aspects of the model we want to pin down with evidence. We want to pin down either directly with some parameter that pins that part down, or we want the model behavior as a whole, or large parts of the model, to be calibrated in a way that will pin down certain parts. Say, OK, this must be the case. This must be the case that this is within this range, that's within that range. And um, here, the more data we have from the data science side, the more effectively we can pin this model down in many areas. Not just directly, not just by measuring that particular thing, but by measuring things elsewhere in the system that imply 
through the logic of the model or indeed through, um, through understanding of, of the uh, underlying state space, what must be going on in this area of the model. So we need to have models that are learning tools that learn more quickly and effectively um, to maximize the potential for dynamic modeling. We need models that are set up to more quickly point out when our cherished misconceptions about the system don't add up. And similarly, when we have a new intervention in place, we want to learn from its effects as soon as possible, find when we're off base and refine our model. And when we're in a new data collection, um, uh, uh, we have new data from the, from the world uh, following an intervention, we want to be able to learn um, and ground the model in, the, in that context effectively. The capacity to improve the model, um, uh, much of that can be automated. And a growing amount of grounding a model structure can be automated. Uh, this is a comment that uh, was back and forth with uh, Dr. Sher Young yesterday, where um, right now with the techniques that we can use, we can pin down parameter values effectively, and you'll see a lot of that. We can pin down aspects of model latent state You'll see some of this in case studies later today for particle filtering. Um, but the techniques that we use, particularly techniques like particle MCMC, can also be used to reason about different models and reason about alternative model structures, uh, alternative model formulations in principle. It's not easy. There's techniques, very sophisticated techniques like uh, reverse jump Monte Carlo techniques which can be used to inform our understanding of what's a more effective model. And I believe that in the multi-decadal time frame, um, uh, we can contribute ways of evolving model structure, our best understanding of model structure. And I believe deep learning and other less theory-grounded approaches have a place in that. But I also believe that, um, that model, uh, model structure can be evolved uh, using uh, additional approaches uh, which are just being explored now at a research level. Um, there's a further capacity uh, here to learn effectively from intervention effects because our models are designed, our system science models are designed to reason about interventions and reason about counterfactuals um, uh, more effectively. So system data science is a forward facing, not a backwards facing enterprise. It recognizes that while we want to learn from evidence that has been collected in the past, our focus lies in many ways on improving things in the world. And that's going to change the nature of the data generating process. So we can't be beholden for our decision making to having lots and lots of data accumulated. We need to be able to boldly go where no person has gone before. Boldly set a course which changes the data generating process. And to do so, we need system science models, but we need humility and constant uh, refreshing of those models and data from the world gathered by big data mechanisms and data science techniques to mesh the, those techniques with those models so that they're learning as quickly and effectively as possible. And we also need for those data science techniques to tap the broader implications of what data we have, and for the system science uh, side to depart from a view where you build a model and it's a discrete product that stays fixed after that to, uh, to evolve more of a regime where it's constantly learning. Okay? So this is the system data science viewpoint um, as I have articulated it right now, um, which makes wholesale use of the best of system science and the best of data science for a perspective that is different from each approach in isolation, but, uh, but leverages the combination for effective capacity for, for decision making within the world. Um, and particularly in the context of uh, counterfactual intervention regimes. We'll be seeing this played out over the next few days uh, as we cover a greater number of case studies, and I'll come back to this on Friday as a, as a point of reference and in terms of a general philosophy of, of how to proceed within these areas. Okay, 
So um, any questions related to this before I go on and spend uh, the next lecture talking about a, the third major data source I want to talk about, which is smartphones and wearables. Any questions on system data science and the perspective and these basic elements or principles behind it? Questions? Okay. So I am going to, if there's no questions, I am going to just end that video. And